Wow, that was quite an introduction, wasn't it, David? Yeah, I don't know if we can live up to that. Now I really got to hype myself up here. I got some kombucha. I'm ready to go. So, uh, <laughs> all right. Very good. Well, uh, so nice to finally meet you, David. Um, I actually don't know how much, to what extent you you know, like how much, how many mutual connections we have and how much I've heard about you and of you and and have, have read from you or heard people say what you said. So um, like I, um, I, I, I feel like um, I already know you despite the fact that this is actually the first time for us to meet. I um, have a huge amount of admiration for many of the things that you did, obviously, including creating Ruby on Rails and, and Basecamp, which we, um, which we use every day at point nine, which we have been using every day for the last 11, 12 years or so. At the same time, I also disagree with a lot of the things that you guys say. So maybe we'll come, we'll get back, we'll get to, to, to some of that. Um, um, and maybe, um, I, th I think no, no need to like introduce ourselves again, because we, we were very kindly introduced already. So I think we can, dive right in and the the topic is um of the of the session is the dismantling of the startup uh, myth so i guess i have an idea of what you have in had in mind with this title but maybe for everybody who um, has not read some of the blog posts or some of your books maybe you can talk a bit about like what is the myth um and and what's wrong with it sure yes Absolutely. So I've been working on internet startups, companies, um, apps for the past 20 years and have done so in a way where it never consumed my life. That uh, for 20 years, Jason and I at Basecamp have built that company and built a wide variety of, of apps. Basecamp itself, High Rise, Backpack, we're building a a brand new email service called hey.com that's launching on Monday, in fact. Um, and we didn't sign up for the 80 hour work week, let alone the 100 hour work week, let alone the 120 hour work week. Um, even though we sort of were based here in the US, which is the ground center epicenter for this eco chamber that is Silicon Valley that is constantly broadcasting this signal that says, unless you work yourself to death, you're not trying hard enough. Unless you're putting in the 80, 100 or 120 hours, you're really just building what? A lifestyle business, a hobby. Um, you're surely not serious about changing the world, right? And it, it, it was that dissonance of building a wonderful, successful, satisfying uh, business that did well by us, Jason and I, we did very well as founders. It did well by our employees, many of which who have been at the company for 10 years or more. It did well for our customers, many of whom have been customers for over a decade, right? So we had all this going on, yet we weren't doing any of the stuff that Silicon Valley kept telling everyone else that this is what you're supposed to do. A, you're supposed to work yourself to death. B, you're supposed to raise a bunch of money. C, you're supposed to burn that money as quickly as possible such that you can become a unicorn, right? That that's the end goal, that's the destination, that's what we're all chasing, except we weren't, right? So we had this, this, this weird sense. We're sitting in, in Chicago. I moved to the U.S. in 2005 and, and lived in Chicago for quite a while. Sitting in Chicago, building this stuff, uh, getting traction with it, and then there's this alternate universe almost existing right next to us. And like the gamma rays are constantly blasting and we're going like, you know what? This is not only nonsense, it's madness. And I think it's profoundly unhealthy and the world deserves a counter melody to that. They deserve to hear that there's another way to go about it, that um, not all startups are just trying to become unicorns. Not every entrepreneur has to work a hundred hours a week to to have a chance of success perhaps hey let's have a conversation about what these words even mean what does success mean what does work ethic mean um oftentimes this ideology that's spewing out of silicon valley is based on a premise of not really examining the words too closely right um 
So that's what we've been doing for quite a long time, trying to examine these words, trying to deconstruct this ideology, and in many ways try to dismantle it. Um, because we went through this phase of, of building this nice company. Today, we're 56 people. We've made more money than we know what to do with. We live a wonderful, peaceful life, and we did all of it on essentially 40 hours a week. Okay. Um, that's not the perhaps standard story here, right? Uh, when I talk to, to fellow entrepreneurs, um, the, 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 the lessons or, or the uh, teachings that I have, they're not about like, how do you work harder? How do you squeeze every last drop out of that lemon? No, because you know what? That is a shitty approach to building a business. Because here's the fact. The fact is most businesses fail. So if you're going to put in the five, six, seven, ten years to build a business, um, at least the way I look at it, is you want to come out on the other side where you are content with what happened regardless of the outcome. If all this sacrifice, the tremendous sacrifice that you're being told to do is basically, I mean, the number of like, oh, here's a list of five things, your health, your friends, your family, your fitness, whatever, pick two if you want to be a successful startup founder, right? Leads you to a place where if if the shit doesn't work, if you get to the end and you got to close that business, as most businesses are, they're closed, um, you're going to look back on that decade with tremendous existential regret, right? What the hell just happened to my 20s? What the hell just happened to my 30s or my 40s or whatever decade you're investing into this? Why would you take those odds? It's like walking into Vegas and saying, like, do you know what? Um, I'm just going to put it all on red four. Because, man, I'm going to get such a jackpot if they hit red four. Okay, I'm going to lose the house. I'm going to be out of my ass. I'm going to do all these other things if we don't come up on red four. I, yeah, perhaps that's why I'm not a gambler. I don't like gambling. I like the odds in my favor in such a way that even when the shit doesn't work or it's even just a modest or, or success or even a slight failure, I can still look back on that with, uh, w with content. So... That's the kind of message we're trying to push out, that, that all this, this ideology that is, that's coming out of Silicon Valley needs to be deconstructed. It needs to be taken apart, dismantled, and particularly when you look at it from a European perspective. I'm Danish. I grew up 25 years in Copenhagen, Denmark. I started working with Jason from Copenhagen, Denmark, right, which kind of endowed me with a sense of um, belief. In, in a bunch of things like the socially democratic welfare state and, and all these other things that made it such that uh, uh, when I came to the US, um, a bunch of things just seemed strange, they seemed silly. Uh, this, this, this whole approach that like entrepreneurs have to be working themselves to death was a foreign concept in, in Denmark. I didn't know anyone in Denmark who ever did that. And I actually even worked at several startups. Doesn't mean we didn't occasionally work a late Friday night or we didn't do something on a, a Sunday. But this kind of all in all or nothing approach to to building a business was completely foreign and therefore um i had this foundation of knowing do you know what alternatives are possible it doesn't have to be this way there's a different way that i would argue and i am arguing is is not just a different way it's a better way for most people most of the time in most situations all right i'll yeah. pause this sermon here for a second interesting <laughs> well actually um i i I think actually because of the last the last couple of words that you that you said, I actually agree with this more than I previously thought because you at least you left an exception there. You said it's what you're saying is the right thing for most people most of the time. Um, I think that's actually probably true. Um, at the same time, as an um, investor, like we're our business is to find the outliers, like uh, try to build companies right. that are not um, like amongst the most people most of the time, but like few people a short amount of the time. Um, yep. And I think startup founders, um, at least many I know, or like me myself when I was a founder, like feel like that too. I agree there is also like a, maybe a special investor lens on this and I'm happy to talk about that. But I think there are many founders who who, who just who don't feel like somebody applies pressure to them to work that hard 
they are just during their, at least, I mean, I can definitely speak for myself, like in, in my 20s, I just, I just couldn't think of doing something, something else. And maybe it was too much, but I, I, I don't think that you have to force the typical founder to work more than 40 hours because it's just like, it's, it's not just no, the, the life. The I don't have to tell you that, right? Yeah. That is the insidious part of it, that this is not about overt pressures. It's not about a VC actually crafting a physical whip and saying like, why the hell are you not in the office on, on Sunday at eight? This is why we're talking about ideology. Ideology exerts its forces in these unspoken ways, right? When all the role models that founders have coming out of Silicon Valley all tell the same bullshit myth origin stories about they, how they came from nothing and they, they worked oh so hard and this is why they have a success, right? That shit seeps in and it seeps in in such a way that it colors the mind of anyone else who reads and internalizes that ideology such that once it has, there's no need to assert sort of overt pressures afterwards, right? But, it but, is but, far more effective yeah. to... Right. But, to, to set a path in this way, which is why I think it is so important for us to to set the counterexample. Because yeah. I've, I've talked to, to so many people who just like, that is their model of what a founder looks like. It's someone who invests a whole decade of their life where it leaves nothing else, right? Because that's what they are. And I also think that this, I actually, in some ways, I regret opening that door by saying most people most of the time. Because there's also this other thing, which I think is the founder syndrome, is that like everyone Everyone thinks they're so fucking special. Everyone thinks that like they are unique and like they're like they need some of that, right? You need some of that gumption to go. The problem is it it makes you blind to all these other factors, and then you think like the the natural or breath of um, the ways you could do it. They don't apply to you, right? No, no, no. You're gonna be the next fucking Bill Gates or, or whatever, and or Marissa Mayer or, or whoever your role model is, and you're gonna internalize what they said about their rose colored glasses origin stories and you're going to focus all on these uh survivorship bias um uh, sort of explorations and you're going to end up with a completely distorted view of of how things could go because if you look deeper about what you're actually trying to do um at least when i talk to most founders like why are you even starting a company like wh what's the purpose like what are you trying to accomplish well a lot of people like they have great ideas they want to see come through they they, they want to create, right? They have energy, they want to put it into a product, they want to put it into a business. These things are not incompatible at all with a reasonably balanced life. In fact, I'd go so far as to say they are empowered when they are paired with a reasonably balanced life. I think when you look back on the past 10 years of tech, it was sort of, I've been in the business for, for 20 years, right? So I kind of split it up, 25 years even. 2000 to 2010, okay, after the, the, the crash, okay, we've got to work real hard. There's this, there's this um, um, uh, kind of, everyone is just so happy. Oh, Google, man, the most amazing company. Oh, Facebook, oh, it, they're so amazing, right? There's this honeymoon phase of the new breed of after dot-com bus companies. They come up, we all look at them. Isn't that amazing? We're so interested in cloning, like, oh, what is uh, Facebook, Google doing? Oh, they're doing open offices with all this air and all this space. Oh, let's all do open offices because that's the best thing. Oh, they work until whatever, 100 hours. Oh, that's great. Let's all do that. Now, the past 10 years, I think the honeymoon is over. And what we're realizing is um, when you take a bunch of people who have nothing else in their life than building the next tech company, you get the kind of tech companies that have been built. And a lot of them are shit. And I mean that in not in an economic sense because they've been fantastically uh, successful. I mean they're shit in a moral, deep sense of it, right? They're corrupt to the core. You look at Google, you look at Facebook, you look at all these companies and you go like, you know what? I don't want any more of that in the world. If I can inspire any entrepreneur out there to do something, it should be to do the opposite of whatever the fuck Google and Facebook and the rest of them are doing because we need no more of that in the world. We need a complete reform of how we're approaching everything from capitalism to to startup culture to to the whole thing um and we're not going to get that by the old methods we're not going to get that by a bunch of myopic founders who invest all of their attention on all of their eyeballs into this one thing they have no art they have no literature they have no sociology they have no psychology they don't have any of this other stuff that informs the whole rounded human 
and we need whole rounded humans to, to take us to the next step. Um, so that's the that's sort of the, the the pitch for a broader, more Renaissance based founder, one that's not just this narrow slice of like, oh, I'm so good at, I don't know what the fuck it is, enterprise software, right? And I can really pour in my 100 hours. I don't have anything else. There, there's none of these other influences on me. Um, no, we've had that. We've seen that. We've taken that route. And in some cases, okay, there's progress. I'm not denying that there's been some good stuff that comes out. Of it. But if you look at the totality of it, if you look at the uh, sort of bottom line after the past 10 years, I think a lot of people would go like, do you know what? This didn't end well. We're not in like a great happy place. We are in a happy place for a handful of entrepreneurs, uh, whether they failed or whether they looted or whether they captured or whatever they did in, in the case of uh, WeWork or whatever, you paid $3 billion to change to so tank a large company and, and kick a bunch of people out or a bunch of investors made a whole lot of money. I, not discounting any of that. I just think that that equation is so uh, wrong, right? Like if you look at that and you look at, and, and you go like, things are working well, right? You really need a special set of glasses to, to see that um, right now. So that's why I'm sort of having this passionate call for like, we need something different. And I think a key part of that difference is that we need different people to build different things. We don't need like fucking Uber for whatever next uh, locust meal that they can apply that uh, business model or that uh, operating uh, approach to. No, time for something new. I mean, first of all, I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with the way you built the, your company. It's a success. It, it it worked well. It makes you happy. I have happy customers. So I, and I'm I'm not saying anything is is wrong with that. I think it's also great that this is possible. But at the same time, I think it's also perfectly fine for founders to want to spend a certain part of their life on almost nothing else than building their startups because there is just nothing that brings them more joy. I think in your 20s, maybe early 30s, um, you, I think there is no reason why a founder, why, why I should tell a founder, hey, you shouldn't work your 60 or 70 hours because maybe that's just um like maybe maybe that's just the the guys or the girls biggest hobby that was definitely the case in my case it's di different when you have a, a family and you have want to spend time with your kids so i think it cha it's, it definitely changes as as you become somewhat well, older well, well let me let, let me let me lob an objection there um this idea that like well it's just a bunch of founders they're just doing what they want to do right a ignores ideology, which is sort of the first topic we started on, right? Like, how do they get to this point that like this is the only thing that kind of the role the world revolves around and this is the only thing that they extract joy from? I think there are significant issues with that, right? Let's put that aside. Let's just focus on the fact that there are very few companies that are built by founders alone. How many founders is typical? What? Two, three? How many companies are built by two or three people? None. They're not, right? Founders hire people. Founders set culture. People who are hired live and work in that culture, a culture that is dominated by founders who are working 60, 80, 100 hours a week is a terrible fucking place to work as an employee. And it never works to essentially just say, no, that's just me, right? Like, I'm just the one sending emails on Friday night at 9 o'clock. I mean, you do whatever you want to do, right? Like, uh, uh, I'm not telling you anything. No, it doesn't work like that. The stuff trickles down. Workaholism trickles down. And now you end up in an even more penary situation here, as you say, like, okay, maybe that's fine for someone in their 20s, right? They don't have any other obligations. They don't have any family. They don't have anything going on in their life, right? Are you going to build a bunch of companies that are just staffed by 20-year-olds? What kind of software are you going to build if you just staff companies solely by 20-year-olds? You're going to build shitty fucking software. Facebook is what you're going to build, right? You're going to build all these things that have no sense of history or time or place or impact beyond what a bunch of hoodie clad 20 year olds who eat pizza at their desk and sleep under it could imagine. Do you know what? That is such a small portion of the human potential. If we and just I, focus yeah. on founding and promoting and pushing 
the 20 year old founders who have nothing else going on in their lives that they hire other 20 year olds who also have nothing else going on in their lives just they can build software for them um that is a gross misallocation of resources money attention and and software um which is why my my plea is that we need a much broader idea of what a good founder is and that it's not just about choice that this idea of what the correct individual choice for one founder or three founders is ignores the fact that no companies are built by three founders they're built by whole staffs of people right and you get the kind of software and 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 lenses on things um that those pe people are endowed with and you know what the, the lens on life that a 20 year old who have had nothing else going on in their life than like i want to build a software company it's a very narrow lens and i know this because I was there, right? I've been building software and running services and starting things since I was 14 years old. So But I mean, I think I the whole, that I mean, the, the, the underlying force behind this is capitalism, right? Um, I, and the fact that it's a, it's, it's a competition, um, companies want to, founders want to win in many internet economies, especially there is a winner takes it all, or at least like winner takes most dynamic which um, maybe can lead to sort of an, an, an arms race. But I'm wondering, there is one thing that I don't quite understand in your argumentation. And, and that is, um, I think if I, if I remember correctly, or if I got it right from like also some of the posts that you read, you're not only saying that the way you think companies should be built is like better because it's, better for the people involved. You're also saying this is more successful. Um, no, I, I think both of these are good points, right? A, a critique of capitalism, B, a critique of success, right? Like what is success? From a venture capital approach of return on a fund that runs for 10 years or whatever, success is um, relatively binary, right? A, do you return your capital? B, what is the internal rate of, of return on that capital, right? Like there are other things, yes, But the, the sort of perhaps most distilled form of the uh, problems with capitalism uh, and, and exponential growth are kind of embedded into the investor structure, right? Which is why I am not really aiming my argumentation at investors. I think that is a, a lost cause because you're not going to teach um, – a man, someone, something that his paycheck depends on him not being taught, right? Like not understanding an investor. It is an incompatible argument here, which gets to the to the core of it, which is this, this view of capitalism. What is capitalism and what is it doing to us? Right. You sort of allude to it a little bit here that capitalism um, kind of pulls us into this doggy dog world frame of reference, right? Where we're like, well, if I don't work a hundred hours, someone else is going to work a hundred hours and they're going to eat my lunch or my leg or my head. And then you, you get founders sort of set up for that fear-based approach where like, shit, I better do it. A, my investors gave me a bunch of money and they don't want a 20% return. That's not why they did what they did, right? They want a 2,000 or 20,000 or 200,000 percent return on, on, on their Maybe that's a slight overstatement, but they want an exponential return on their investment because that's how their portfolios are set up, especially when you look at technology VCs, right? Two companies or one company ends up paying for the whole fund. So you have the normal pressures of capitalism, then you turbocharge them with VC capitalism and VC uh, return expectations, right? Yeah, no fucking wonder you end up with a sludge of a toxic ideology that is pushing founders in a certain specific direction. Now, is that the only version of capitalism that possibly exists in the world? No, right? I, this is, have I you mean, seen another I'm one? I'm sitting here that, as a capitalist. Have you seen another one? Have you, have you anywhere seen a, a better way to allocate scarce resources than capitalism? Yes, yes. Because because, because because I can tell you it has been tried in Germany and it didn't work. This is this is because the argument gets reduced to this nonsense binary flip switch between capitalism and socialism, which is nonsense, outdated, um, and irrelevant. The yeah. modern interpretation of or critique even of capitalism is not like are there capitalists or are there not, right? 
It is where are we on the spectrum, right? You, you, I mean, and, 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 and I'm of, all, I mean, and, and I'm all in favor of a Scandinavian or German or French like social state, like social security. I'm not arguing for like the U.S. model of that, right? Um, but please go ahead. Well, I think it, I think it, it, those things they go together, right? Like if you look at why Germany or, or Denmark are structured the way they are, why do they have strong, small and medium-sized business sort of foundations in it? Why is there a middle stand? In, in Germany that kind of is a core of the economy, why is it not all just a bunch of winner take all companies, right? Is because the entire approach is quite different, right? Which gets into all these other critiques of capitalism, mm -hmm. which is that capitalism actually works much better when you don't allow someone to be a winner takes all. When you have strong monopoly enforcement, for example, antitrust, right? Um, when you break companies up once they acquire too much market share and too much power, um, you're 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 better off. Um, that I think is a, is a it, it's a long road, and I don't know if we're going to do a full critique of capitalism on here. I would just sort of leave the point being that like this is a spectrum, and it's a spectrum on a socioeconomic country level or block level, right? Like you can talk about capitalism in the EU, you can talk about capitalism in Germany, you can also talk about capitalism within the company, right? Basecamp is a capitalist company, right? Like it's not like we, we sell products and customers pay us money for it and there's an exchange of goods and there's all these other things. Um, so we have to broaden our perspective of like what capitalist, uh, capitalism is and question what it forces us to do, right? Because a lot of this is, is again, this dog eat dog world metaphor, which just doesn't apply to us, right? We have competition, yes. We don't need to win entire markets, also yes, right? Like, what is the market share of Basecamp in project management? I don't even fucking know. A 1%, half percent, a, uh, a quarter of a percent? There's no, no domination. Yet there's a, a tremendously satisfying uh, company there and, and product and all these other things, right? And the world is – this is why my argument is not just like, well, you can do one thing or you can do the other thing and it's all equally good. No. I, I, I'm not taking that door. I'm not opening that door. I am specifically saying the world is better off when we have more companies of smaller sizes such that you don't end up with the dominance that you get from the VC model where you get like the Facebook and the Google and the Amazons crushing everything else. In fact, I, my argument is that the stronger, more original Adam Smith level of capitalism actually functions far better. And Adam Smith would agree, Wealth of Nations, wonderful book. And full of critiques of modern capitalism, um, that we're better off when we don't have the cartels, when we don't have the monopolies, when we don't do all these other things. So why are we just waiting for enforcement, right? You could say, well, that is the job of the antitrust enforcers, that they should be sort of setting the rules and breaking things up. No, we could also just choose as individual entrepreneurs and founders that we're not going to be more of that. How can we build the opposite? How can we build the, the, the world we want to live in? Which is yeah, not I think, you, world of five I think seconds. you would have to change human nature if 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 you're to that you have to you have to there stop you people. This you is have to, literally you, what you, I'm trying to do. All right, then I got it. Then I got you got to the root of the, <laughs> Actually, the, no, the disagreement. No, let, let let me let me put a little ante on that. It's not human nature because human nature uh, implies some sort of uh, um, kind of innate idea of what capitalism is. Human nature have tried a lot of things over uh, the ages. Yes, the capitalist ideology uh, as it exists right now is, is, is the dominant ideology, but there existed many others. What we need to change is human culture. That is immensely possible. If you look back on just what has happened in the last five years on broad cultural and economic issues, right? We've seen large changes, right? So, I am of the school of thought that like fight for the change you want to see and we can absolutely fucking make it happen. <laughs> I think right we're out of time. I, th we, we, I think we need more time, David, to solve uh, all the issues that we just yes, touched on, but I would love, to, would love to follow up on that. Yes. I actually think, think DHH has moved the dial for you, Christoph. I actually think he's convinced you a little bit. <laughs> But we'll see. Uh, yeah, not yeah, not yeah, not yeah. completely, not completely. But uh, <laughs> I get the feeling. I get the feeling. Um, and I love, you know, no art, no literature, no psychology, no economics, no sociology. Uh, 
you know what? It's hard to deny that there's an awful lot of very successful entrepreneurs out there who really have a narrow perspective on the world. And, you know, I'm not so sure you have to change human nature. I think you need to change uh, uh, societal structures because if human nature is the same, then why is Europe so much different to the United States? You know, why are large parts of Europe, I should say, look at the Nordics. The Nordics would be the most different to the United States, and I would say sociologically far more evolved at this point in history. The world goes round. It'll change. It'll go to other countries. Um, but then again, the United States has produced some of the most successful companies ever and some of the greatest innovation ever. So it's an argument that could go on and on. But uh, thank you, DHH. Thank you, Christoph Jans. Uh, fantastic. Uh, I think anybody listening to that would have enjoyed it. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks guys. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. No, this is Thank great. you.